Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, the people's business is at hand and Carolina legislators are in session. And so far, it has not been uninteresting and maybe even good theater. Welcome back to the most widely watched program on Carolina business and public policy. This time straight from a primary source, North Carolina Speaker of the House Tim Moore will join us later. But first, policy watcher and policy watchers and analysts Jonathan Kapler of the UNC system and poli sci professor Karen Kudrowski from Winthrop will begin this week's dialogue. Major funding also by Novant Health bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Jonathan Kapler, Director of State Government Relations, University of North Carolina System, Karen M. Kadrowski, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Winthrop University, and special guest Tim Moore, North Carolina Representative and House Speaker. And now, here's Chris Williams. Hello, welcome to our program. Uh, Jonathan, Kieran, good to have you both here. Thank you. Glad and, to be here. Kieran, you've been here for a while. Jonathan, uh, shame on you for not being here uh, <laughs> earlier more than you have been, but uh, good to have you both here. So Jonathan, uh, here we are, uh, long session. I've uh, got some interesting things being debated in Raleigh, in the, in the General Assembly. What do you think one of the most, if not the most important issue is right now? Sure. Well, education funding is always a hot topic, certainly higher education funding, which is something I care deeply about. But we've seen a lot of discussion about transportation issues and transportation and infrastructure funding um, and incentives, which has really been a hot topic as of late. And I think we'll see that conversation continuing throughout the legislative session. If you had to tweeze out, what do you think would be what would be a surprise uh, decision? What, what would you say could be a surprise on any of those issues? Well, I think uh, if we came together somewhere in the middle, I think there's some pretty strong perspectives on economic development incentives, on transportation funding, and I think we're already seeing some examples of how um, some compromise is being met there in the middle. But we've got a long way to go in the budgeting process, and so I think the legislature is going to probably adjourn some time in the summer, which yeah. is pretty <laughs> wide open, but uh, hedge my bets there a little bit. But, uh, you know, I think folks are kind of staking out that, that ground right now, and where we end up is, I think, really going to be a big question. Karen, what do you, same, same question. What do you think the hottest issue in the public? Well, I think, and we have similar answers. Uh, what's going on in South Carolina is really a continuation of what's been happening in the last couple of years. So one has been the ongoing saga regarding the Department of Social Services and how it can best serve the vulnerable populations that it serves. We're looking at infrastructure, um, gas tax, um, our sacred gas tax may be rising. Uh, but then also there's a whole series of issues surrounding higher education probably most prominently the state of South Carolina State University. You, you know, we've got two new speakers in both Carolinas. You've got yes. Jay Lucas and, of course, Tim Moore is going to be our guest mm -hmm. uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, let's drill down a little bit on this. Let's, uh, let's go to Tim Moore, and, and we'll ask him about this later. One of his big issues, what, what, he put a stake in the ground on his first speech as speaker to say, you know, enough with bipartisanism. Let's figure out how we can work together. What's ironic about that is Republicans have firm control of North Carolina. North Carolina, arguably a purple state, but Republicans are in charge. Um, is that surprising to you, uh, number one, that there's that kind of of partisanism going on, or at least acrimony within North Carolina? And then the second thing, do you think we're going to be able to make come together a little bit closer? 
Yeah, that, uh, I think some of it's to be seen, um, but I think that it shouldn't be a big surprise that there are various caucuses within the Republican caucus. And we saw this when Democrats were in control yeah. of state government, where they weren't always on the same page. I think uh, what we were used to, though, was when the Republicans first took control of the General Assembly after the 2010 elections, there was a Democratic governor that they kind of collectively pushed back against and had some policy discussions uh, with. And now that there is a kind of uniform control, that low-hanging fruit's gone, and I think various elements within the Republican party are starting to kind of express themselves and they have different thoughts on things like economic development incentives and education funding. Speaker Lucas, one of one of his priorities yes. is transportation. Absolutely. It was ethics, uh -huh. uh, but that's off the table now, I know, to some degree. Yes. But transportation is, and, and the governor's pushed back pretty dramatically on any kind of gas tax increase, but has seemingly agreed that transportation's an issue. Do you think transportation's going to make some headway this year? Um, well, I think it has to, uh, because we are, um, you know, we're a tr tourism dependent state. And so making sure that people can get to our beaches without hitting too many potholes is a pretty important uh, part of our economic development. Um, and I th also think that it's important to remember that irrespective of what the governor says, the governor in South Carolina is a very weak governor. So, you know, habitually there will be um, line item vetoes and full vetoes that are overturned. And I think that the legislature is approaching a compromise on what the gas tax will look like. So you mean weak process-wise, but yes. not weak necessarily with a bully pulpit. The, uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. It has to do with the structure of the institution of the governorship. So do you think governor. that the state house will win the day when it comes to raising the gas tax? Cap? Absolutely. Yeah. What do, you, what do you think of North Carolina with the gas tax? Yeah, I think that they're actually coming to terms with that and have, have developed, I think, a pretty good compromise as where that, that, that's going. And I think the key there is stability and transportation funding for the state of North Carolina. And I think the long range planning so the state can be more strategic mm -hmm. with where those investments are in the state is a key element of that. And I think one of the very first things of substantial uh, meaning that the legislature has done this year in North Carolina is deal with this transportation and gas tax funding issue. You know, though, Jonathan, is that is that enough to really even scratch the surface of transportation funding in a state like North Carolina? Yeah, well, we're a big state and growing one, right? We just passed Michigan is the ninth most populous state in the country and so we've got a lot of needs in the state of North Carolina and so I think that's why we're starting to hear conversations around a, a bond infrastructure bond uh, particularly on transportation hopefully around other things that the state has needs in and state government infrastructure universities as well um, but yeah there there are some great needs out there and I think that that gas tax is part of the equation but not all of it is bonding a way to do it in South Carolina with a 40 billion dollar uh, but, um, there's not a lot of support in the legislature or with the governor for bonds. Um, and and it's, it comes from a, a, an ideological perspective that, um, that borrowing money is not a good public policy strategy. So they, um, they want to see a pay-as-you-go model instead. But that's tough while trying to keep ga you know, taxes low. Yeah. And on the issue of the gas tax, this is really pretty interesting. The Winthrop, most recent Winthrop poll has found that actually South Carolinians are in favor of raising the gas tax, but just enough, or, but, but they want to make sure that it remains lower than the yeah. gas taxes in surrounding states. Let's, uh, we've got about two minutes left before we bring Speaker Moore on. Let me, let me ask you both one-offs. Uh, Karen, uh, let me stay with you. South Carolina, there's, there was a lot of talk about ethics reform. Uh, within the state house, yes. the general assembly, that's been sidelined to some degree. I understand. Is that right? It 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 is not um, on the front burner, but ethics reform discussions never seem to go away. Well, let, okay, let, <laughs> there let, let always me seems to this. be something that puts it back on the agenda. The broader question is: Do ethics is the place for ethics reform really within the state house, or is that? Um, and I'm not going to be good at this, but is that more of an attorney general um, or law enforcement issue? Isn't that what ethics really comes down to in many cases? Yes and no, because often um, legislatures around the, the country are self-governing. You know, they are self-policing. So if they're talking about changing the rules of behavior within the institution, that's not an issue for the attorney general. If we're talking about criminal behavior, then clearly we're talking about an attorney general. And when we focus on ethics reform, we are often talking about the rules that govern the institution itself. Well, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the question is better asked to say, shouldn't it be a non-affiliated third party that takes on ethics? Uh, yes, and I think what happens in many other states when faced with these thorny partisan issues is that they will create a nonpartisan commission 
that will come forward with a proposal that then the only option for the legislature is to vote it up or down without amendment. Yeah, okay. And let me correct my grammar. It's unaffiliated, clearly. <laughs> not uh, one off very quickly, Jonathan. In North Carolina, uh, there has been some, some talk about rejiggering, if you will, the sales tax for urban and redistributing right. that revenue to rural counties. Redistribution of revenue is often kind of uh, used with Democrats, not Republicans. <laughs> this is kind of funny. Uh, so in the light of that, is it's not being well received in urban areas that they're going to be losing this and we'll have to raise tax to make up for that. How do you think that's going to end up? Right. Well, I think we just saw some recent proposals along these lines from primarily the state Senate. Um, the governor recently came out and said that he wasn't very supportive of this. And you got to keep in mind of where he's coming from. He is coming from uh, being a former mayor of Charlotte and he's got to run mm -hmm. uh, for elections statewide. And the urban vote in North Carolina is increasingly an important piece of the electoral puzzle here in the state of North Carolina. So I think it's still really early to see where that conversation goes. Is that really a hard and fast line that the Senate's drawing or is this really the opening gamut and a larger conversation around how we structure our taxes in North Carolina. Yeah, okay. Um, by the way, is the purple shirt represent the, the new color of North Carolina? Not, well, it's not it's spring like and yeah. uh, represents the part of the nature well of the state. Well done, by the way. <laughs> and, by, and I want to say, we did, we did not get to the, 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 the economic impact report that the UNC system put out that was a, that was a, a big report. Uh, please come back and talk about Absolutely. that because that is it's an important landmark piece of research. Uh, next week on this program, his name is Michael McGuire, and he is homegrown in the Carolinas, but now the CEO of the global and certainly the North American firm of Grant Thornton. He will be our guest on this program. And then in two weeks, this is an interesting thing, in two states that are net exporters of goods and services, uh, we will have the Irish ambassador to the United States, Anne Andrews, will be here. After more than a decade in the General Assembly, Cleveland County Republican Tim Moore became the Tar Heel State Speaker of the House. One of the prime objectives in his first speech to the House membership was to promote a deeper idea of bipartisanship. In addition to that, what will other top priorities be and what does he think need to be championed? Joining us now in his sixth term in the General Assembly is North Carolina Speaker of the House, the Honorable Tim Moore. Your Honor, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, you clearly put a stake in the ground about bipartisanship, but really, why can't we work better together, certainly as all Republicans? What do you think? Well, we've actually worked very well together. Uh, recently, we have adopted bipartisan legislation dealing with economic development, legislation dealing with our highway funding, with, internal, with the Internal Revenue Code update, and we've also worked uh, with the Senate as well. We, we had a press conference recently where both the Senate and the House leadership came together and acknowledged we had resolved a lot of major differences in tax policy and pushed through legislation uh, within just a matter of weeks. So we're working together and the bipartisan efforts that have occurred have not been just you know, one or two Democrats voting with the uh, Republicans, but significant numbers, about 30 Democrats, in fact, voting with Republicans on bills. So very significant. We're very pleased with that. So, Speaker Moore, would you go out on a limb and say, certainly this session, but maybe going forward, that, that relations, and that's not even going to say it well, but uh, there will be a friendlier way to make policy in North Carolina? Well, certainly hope so. We, we, will, we will have disagreements, both within the Republican caucus and, and between the parties. But I think, you know, what Seal saying, learning how to, be, how to disagree without being disagreeable, we've really worked hard to do that. We've been very transparent with the process, been very, very open. Uh, the committee process has worked very well. And, and I think I've heard very little complaining from members about not being informed and not being engaged. Uh, please come back at the end of the session because I want to ask you the same question and see how, you, <laughs> yeah. see how you're faring. Hey, we'll, we'll, thank, see, we'll see if it's the same. Yeah, right? thanks, for the, <laughs> thanks for the effort, Jonathan. Yeah, well, I did want to take the opportunity while you're here to, to ask about uh, capital and infrastructure. We talked a little bit about this already, and there has been a conversation really about a couple of different things. One is kind of a transportation infrastructure bond and one around state government infrastructure. And the governor, I don't think, has really put out a clear plan on that yet, although has clearly talked about that, including in the state of the state. And so I'm curious, conversations in the legislature and what your current thinking is about that. We are looking at, at the bonds, uh, particularly more for the transportation side. We passed legislation last year that changed the way we fund our roads so that it takes the politics out of it and it's based on the, the metrics of where the need it, needs are for road construction. That's caused some issues, particularly in the rural areas. 
And so the thought is to bring in the bond proposals to try to kickstart some shovel ready projects. Um, where that will go, I don't know at this point. We're still counting those just to see what the, uh, um, what the body's leaning is on it. How, how does it, is a quick follow up on that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there is talk about repealing a 1987 mandate that, that DOT had around, it's called MAPS, mm -hmm. and it, the whole idea was to freeze development on private land so if and when DOT took control or bought private land that it wouldn't be at premium prices. Um, and it might even be a house, house proposal. I, I'm not sure about that. I've seen the bill and I, I can't comment okay. too much in detail, but I will tell you that is a real concern. The, the county I represent, Cleveland County, which is in this region, of course, we have a number of folks who have been affected by that who own property and what's going to be the right of way. And so you have a project that's been discussed for many years where development has been limited for over 10 years where folks can't do construction on their house, can't do remodeling. And some examples were where folks were now wheelchair bound and they can't get a permit to build a major wheelchair access. Does that bill have legs? I think it has legs. I, it's, it's probably not going to pass in its original form, but we need to do something. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Karen. Okay. Um, to change the subject a little bit, North Carolina has moved its presidential primary date up to be in February, shortly after the South Carolina primary date. Can you tell me what the legislature hoped to achieve with this change? Well, we wanted to make North Carolina more relevant in the presidential primaries. Uh, we have a ton of delegates because of the size of the state. And uh, because of changes in the RNC rules, we're probably going to have to modify that. The House is looking at a bill right now that would change it to either March 1st or March the 15th. We're still working through it, but that is a bill that's uh, working its way through the House. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if it's tied to that specifically, but we just saw recently in North Carolina, Rick Santorum, who's considering a presidential bid in the state. And I'm wondering if that has some relationship to the well potentially said. early yeah. primary state status in North Carolina. Yeah, good point. Good he, question. He, yeah, he came by to visit us at the General Assembly, but he was he was in town at, for some sort of conference. But it was uh, great to have him there. We recognized him in the House, and then he came and spoke to the GOP caucus as well. There's a huge debate around incentives in North Carolina. South Carolina has its mojo, no doubt about it. You know, you talk about the economic development announcements. North Carolina seems to be struggling to find footing in what commerce and what good announcements uh, th that they can work toward. You know, talk about refreshing what JDIG was. Talk about a public-private partnership, what, what North Carolina Department of Commerce is. What, what can North Carolina do to get its momentum back around economic development? Well, we're, it's a work in progress. We've worked to streamline and reduce taxes overall for everyone. That's been the primary objective. Incentives do still have a part, uh, are a part of the equation. We passed legislation recently on a bipartisan way that's now pending in the Senate that would expand the incentives, that would expand some tax adjustments that would help, particularly with large corporations. We're really trying to lure an auto manufacturer. We'd like to, we'd like to catch up with South Carolina on that. But a lot of our job growth has been in, in terms of small jobs. We're doing very well in terms of you know, small companies that don't get covered in the media and don't get talked about. You know, it's the, what's the old saying of trying to land the whale. You want to land the really large company, the auto manufacturer, those things. We haven't done met very many of those, but we are getting some smaller to medium sized businesses, often without the need of incentives. But for the large companies, incentives have to be a part of the equation, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the, that the economic development conversation really, we're kind of in transition in North Carolina. And South Carolina is a really fundamentally different, what I know about it, fundamentally different structure than North Carolina. And we're kind of in this kind of four, five years into the Republican control of state government, we're seeing a shift in how we're approaching these things. But I think at the bedrock, transportation and infrastructure are key. The education infrastructure is key, making sure that the state has the talent that it needs uh, to supply uh, uh, employers with what they can, need to be successful. Question for the speaker. Yeah, and I just am curious about uh, you. Were, you were a board of governors members back several years mm -hmm. ago, and I'm curious about board how of that, governors of UNC of the UNC yeah. system exactly, and curious how that has informed your uh, experience in the general assembly and how you approach education. Well, certainly support higher education. We have one of the preeminent university systems in the nation, and we're very proud of that. Uh, we're going to do all we can to see that it's ex you know that it's expanded that education remains an affordable opportunity for our citizens and that also the university has a major seat at the table as far as economic development and in terms of research and development you know research grants 
the amount of money that comes from that is incredible. And then if you look at the whole RTP, uh, our, our friends to the South and South mm -hmm. Carolina are, are doing well in manufacturing, but they can't keep up with us on that. Uh, the RTP is really uh, head and shoulders. I mean, the competition of there, you either have to look in, uh, in Connecticut or California to even come close with what we have in the RTP. And we'd like to expand that. And, and we, we, we are a leader in high tech, by uh, pharmaceutical, and we want to continue seeing that. So and the universities are key to that. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> That's a surprise. Yeah. Though, yeah. <laughs> well, I was wondering if you could tell us what you see as your key legislative priorities aside from economic development. Well, if I had a list of 10 priorities, job development and economic development would be the top eight. Okay? So, <laughs> so, then, so then I've got to find two more. Okay. Uh, transportation funding uh -huh. with, of course, we dealt with the transportation funding legislation and, and you all were talking before I came on about South Carolina. It, it's, that is a constant struggle to keep up. We, we, we are fortunate that both South Carolina and North Carolina are growing states. Mm -hmm. This is a region of the country where people want to live, where businesses want to locate. And it's so, so part of the demand as far as transportation is because people want to be here. So that's a good thing. So transportation and then of course education. We, we need to make sure our schools are as great as they can be. Uh, I'm a parent of two children in the public schools, so I'm not only politically invested, I'm personally invested. But those would be my, uh, I guess, top mm -hmm. 10, or really top three issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on transportation, so the House and the Senate have come to some agreement, or at least are pretty close, on a, what gas tax in North Carolina should be. That seems, at best, like a just a first step to try to figure out funding transportation long term. How do we need to be thinking about about long-term revenue sources to get our roads, bridges, and infrastructure going in the right direction. Right. So the legislation we, we passed was to, in fact, give immediate tax relief at the pump, and it drops from the current 37.5 all the way down to 34 cents. Once it gets to 34 cents, and that's over a period of uh, three years, I believe, mm -hmm. once it gets to that, it then is, instead of having this, we had this index, and I don't think South Carolina, or I don't know if any other states had it, we had this index that was tied to basically the, the, the uh, commodity price. And as everyone knows, gas, oil prices have fluctuated wildly over the past couple of years. That made it a very uh, unpredictable uh, tax. And so we've tried to come up with something that's more even killed. So we have a new formula based on the consumer, in, consumer price index for energy coupled with population which would allow any tax adjust adjustments from then to either be, to be very modest, either up or down. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to give some stabilization and tax relief. But going forward to your point, that was a key part of the, of the conversation, that this is not one and done, that this has fixed it. So we're gonna have to look at fees. We have some fees that have been in place for 20 years that no one's looked at that probably should be raised. We're gonna try to look at other revenue sources. There, there are discussions about a number of options and we're gonna take time and, and try to find something, but we can no longer solely rely on the, on the gas tax because for one thing, cars get better mileage. Mm -hmm. right. And you have some cars that are hybrids or electric mm -hmm. that are essentially paying nothing to be on the roads. So we're gonna to have to find some other, some other things to look at. We, we've got about a minute left, question. Well, I'm curious, uh, redistricting reform is one issue that's popped up in the House a couple of times. I think it's yeah. passed out of the House uh, once or twice, and the Senate hasn't, hasn't heard it at all. We're kind of halfway through the 10-year the, the, um, the period that before we do redistricting again. Any thoughts on that? Any prospects for that? There's really not much conversation about it. You know, we went through a good process for redistricting last year. The, the plans were upheld by all of the courts and the courts ruled that what we did was both fair and legal, and it was a transparent process. And so the, I, I've heard less outcry for redistricting reform because I believe folks think that we got it right. We did it fairly, we did it the way it should be. We didn't play games. Yeah, uh, Representative, thank you for being on the program. It's an honor to be here. And thanks, thank you, and thanks for stepping up to do it. Uh, please do come back and let's, let's, let's take your temperature again about what's, what's happened. And, and maybe after the session, later on in the year, we can find out what kind of success you all had. Glad to. Thank you, and thank, thank you. you. Travel safely. Karen, good to have you on the program. Thank you, Best My of pleasure. luck at Winthrop. Thank and you. Best of luck at the UNC system. Yes. Got your hands full, Jonathan, but <laughs> no better person to have in, it. in your hands. Uh, thank you for being on our program. Uh, until next week, I'm Chris William. Gosh, happy spring. What a great time to live in the Carolinas. Uh, until next week, good night. 
Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.